Studentkinja iz Kolomba, predstavnice Šri Lanke, bila je na korak od diplome advokata za privredno pravo koje je studirala na univerzitetu u Nottinghamu, kada je slučajni susret sa profesoricom pjevanja promijenio tok njene karijeri. Prvi je južnoazijski sopran koja je kao solistkinja nastupala u kraljevskoj operi u Covent Gardenu i bila predstavljena kraljici Elizabeti II. kao predstavnica Commonwealtha za umjetnost. Umjetnica koja je bila voljna da se prepusti svakoj ukazanoj prilici sa žarom, vratila se na ovo prelijepo ostrvo koji naziva domom i nastavlja da fascinira svijet svojim zlatnim glasom. Pjeva na deset jezika, ali kaže da ni jedan nije moćan ili dubok kao jezik same muzike. Growing up in Sri Lanka, we had certain traditions and certain ideas of what we would be. Um, and being a society which is very conservative in so many ways, I always imagined I would be, you know, as many people would be at that time, doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant. This is really the journey that we, we took at that time. Um, I went on to be a lawyer. This was my first profession. Um, and I then specialized as a commercial lawyer. And on my way, I had a sequence of, I say, happy accidents that led me to the most extraordinary lady, um, a teacher who then really was the catalyst in changing the course of my direction of life. And I, I, we had a meeting and it was again by accident. I went for a summer camp as a university student just because I loved to sing, not because I was a, music of, a student of music. And uh, I went for this camp and they asked me to sing for no apparent reason, just because they wanted to give somebody else a chance, I think. And I was from Sri Lanka, which was very unusual. And then I did this uh, performance, and then the head of that took me aside and said, you know, there's somebody else here you should meet, who was the head of a conservatory in London. And uh, he said, you really must do something with your singing. And I said, well, I have no plans. I am, I am going to be an, uh, a lawyer. And he said, wait, let me introduce you to somebody. And then he gave me the contact details of a, of a very eminent teacher, Pamela Cook, in London, in England. Even at that time, I didn't go and see her because I was so busy with university. I was in the Law Society. I was president of the Students' Union, the International Students' Union. I was involved in theater, in drama, in music, in my law studies. I really had no time. So, uh, and it was not part of my plan, you know, to be a singer. So I finished my university degree and then I was clearing up and I, I found this piece of paper that this professor gave me with this lady's telephone number and I thought, oh, I promised to call her two years ago and I didn't call. And of course, after this time you can't really telephone somebody. So I sent her a letter and I said, I'm so sorry I couldn't get in touch as I promised to, but I'm just you know, finishing my degree and I'd like to come and see you just to say hello. Then she called me on my, uh, my residence line and then she said, come and meet me. And I, so I went to see her and we had a little bit of a sing, we had a chat and then she said, uh, this is something you should consider very seriously. I think you have a, a certain talent which can take you right to the top of your field and you have to want it badly enough and if you want it, I will help you to get there. Uh, my background in singing before, I'll get to that later, uh, was not enough to get me through one of those auditions so I had to work very hard. Languages was something we didn't have because I were bilingual in Sri Lanka but we don't really access European languages. I had no need to. Um, so I worked very hard on that and on music and learning and, and finally um, I went for an audition. I went for several auditions to the leading conservatoires in London uh, and, uh, and I was offered scholarships from all of them. So then I thought oh maybe this is the way for me, you know, and I thought I always loved the idea of singing, but I suppose I didn't have the courage to, to take that step because somehow in Asia, South Asia, we don't automatically think of becoming singers or dancers or actresses or musicians. It's, it was not traditional for us to do that. So I then um, thought this is a very important decision. I spoke to my parents and they said, you know, you already have a great plan B, so follow your dream. It's okay. If it doesn't work, you have something wonderful to come back to. And at least you've tried. And I believed at that time the most important thing was to try. So I went to music school <coughs> and uh, <coughs> went on to, do, uh, to specialize. 
Um, then there was another audition where they, this time they were going to take only four people uh, from my voice type. And I thought, oh, OK, hey, let me try. Uh, and again, I tried. And again, I got one of those positions. And I thought, maybe this is, this is a sign, you know? And then when I finished that, I, um, I thought, oh, I must get into the business and into the profession because I didn't really have that experience that others would have getting to that position at that stage because they would have been singing for a lot longer. Um, and then I, uh, I, there was this, the Royal Opera House Young Artist Program, Covent Garden. It's, it was the most coveted, most famous young artist program in the world. And everybody wants to be on it because if you get through that door, your career will change immediately. I called a few friends and I said I have to do a recording and when are we able to do it and when we went to the recording studio the only time that was available was um, 7 o'clock in the morning. For a singer to do a recording at 7 o'clock in the morning is un it's Im almost I would say impossible but that was the only time they had. <clears throat> so my friend very kindly said okay somehow let's make it happen. We did the recording and then I took it, I ran with it to my teacher and she said no it's not good enough, it will not get you to the next level. So you have to do another recording. <laughs> I said when? There was no time because now it was due in a day. Uh, so again, I called the studio and they said, oh, we're full. We have nothing. We can't give you anything. And I said, you have to give me something, at least half an hour, 45 minutes, anything you can give me. And then they said, OK, we don't normally do this, but you know, because it's a re-recording, re we can then try and, and maybe we can slot you in at 11 o'clock at night. So I said, OK, we'll take it. I asked my friend who said, what, 11 o'clock? First you get me at 7 o'clock, now 11 o'clock at night. I said, please do this for me. And he said, OK. So then we uh, did another recording. This time my teacher said, OK, this is OK. The opera house was going to close at 11 o'clock at night, I believe, after the last show. And we had to hand it in that day. And I put this application together. And uh, I remember getting on the London Underground on the tube. And I got on this tube and I got off at Covent Garden Station and I just ran. I must have got off at you know, 10.52 or something like that. And I just ran, ran, ran so fast. Luckily, it's not too, too, uh, not the distance is not too much. And um, I made it to the door, I think at two minutes to 11. And I gave this application and I said, sir, can you please make sure this application reaches the program? And he said, young lady, you left this a little late. I said, yes, but please get this in. And he said, OK. So we got it in. Um, and then I thought nothing more about it.
there were hundreds of applications. They, they brought it, you know, they select and they bring it down and they bring it down and they bring it down. I made this 24 from all the best singers in the world. I thought, at least this is something for me. And I thought, the rest, it doesn't matter really. We were given notice of the, the last audition on the main stage at Covent Garden. And I was selected as one of these singers and I, I couldn't believe it. I always thought, I will only go to this profession if there's a very clear signal that this is the way for me to go. So um, I remember doing the audition and you know so many little things happened. The corner of my dress got burnt when I was ironing it and something got late and somebody else you know didn't turn up and you know so many things went wrong but I thought it's okay it's good because it means the audition will go well. Even when I was doing the audition on the stage there was a big disturbance in the back so they stopped me halfway and I thought oh then it's over you know and they said no 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 wait it's just that we want to have quiet when you sing so we want to stop this and start again please and I thought oh my goodness <laughs> it was not something I expected but um, finally you know they said please you know we're sorry for the interruption but please start again and then I thought I have six minutes in which to change my life and I remember I, I sang like a demon I think this is the word I can't think of any other not in a bad sense, but I had this single-minded drive and I thought I'm going to do my best and then if it doesn't work, it's okay. At least I know that I did my best. I was on my way home. I remember I was on the London Underground and they called me and they said, so, you've been selected. And I remember at that moment, I, I think I screamed. I was on the, on the tube, you know, with so many people in the middle of the night. It must have been after midnight. And I just screamed and I thought, oh my goodness and my life begins now and really it was that I've had opportunities to sing in so many amazing places and with so many extraordinary artists and um, on stages that I never dreamed that would be open to me really um, if I were to mention a few amazing places of course Covent Garden is for me my heart uh, it's where I started it's where I, the door opened for me for the first time so that I still remember the first moment when I put my foot on that stage and you can feel the history and the depth and the artistry of all these great artists that have been before and you can almost feel their spirit on the stage. It's, it's very difficult to explain but it, it's a moment I'll never forget. In addition, I've had the privilege of singing in most of Europe, um, very special places if I were to call, uh, of course, in Italy. Uh, very special because I think I did one of my favorite operas, uh, La Boheme, the character of Mimi, in uh, Verona, which was uh, at the Teatro Filarmonico, which is such a special place. Um, I had opportunities to sing also in uh, La Scala Milano, in La Fenice, in, in Venezia, um, in addition in Madrid, in so many places, in Germany, in Spain, in the Netherlands, Belgium. Finland, uh, many places and as a student, uh, as a young artist, I remember taking um, part in so many competitions and I, I was successful in six international competitions in Italy, France, um, Spain, ne the Netherlands, the Finland, Turkey. Uh, I got to sing uh, at the Top Copy Palace which is extraordinary. I mean and to sing for people that you would never really imagine that you would be able to, to perform for. Um, kings and queens and heads of state and great artists with other great artists uh, the opportunity to sing for uh, His Royal Highness King, uh, Prince Charles' 60th birthday celebrations at Buckingham Palace to meet Her Majesty the Queen um, as, a, as a, an ambassador for the arts from Asia so it's been a, a fairy tale really there's no other word for me to, to use I also was very blessed in terms of uh, my family I, I met an extraordinary man who uh, is now my husband of almost 12 years and uh, and we have two beautiful children uh, aged six and eight so it's really like a, again I say my little magical fairy tale because in the business it's quite hard to meet people who understand where you're going and what you want to do and your journey. This journey has taken us to so many places. We found ourselves living on th in three continents at one point, which was a little ridiculous, but we were between Asia and Europe and Australia. So finally we decided this is not the best way forward for our family, for our children. And so a few years ago, 
we made a very difficult decision, but we think it's the right decision, that we wanted our children really to know where they come from and what they, what, who they belong to and really their cultural roots and their heritage and that they should have an opportunity to know their grandparents and to really grow up in a place where they can identify as being, as being where they're from. I was working in London. My husband was working between Sydney and Singapore and he just had a second month to New York. So at that moment we had uh, London, Sydney, Singapore and New York on the table and we decided to come to Colombo. Since coming back, I've had an amazing few opportunities as well. I've had the opportunity to work with this uh, extraordinary organization um, called SAC, which, which deals with eight countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, you know, um, so many people in the world belong to this, these eight nations. And so I've been working in art and culture, organizing programs to do with music and dance and art and, and literature. And it's been an extraordinary journey in that way. Um, however, even though I've taken on this line of, uh, of, of administration in the arts, I've still always tried to keep my journey of that of a singer alive, because in a way I feel that's my heart, really. Uh, and so, in addition to this, I've also tried very hard to make sure that we bring opportunities to people to open the door for them. Opera is a very unusual art form in Asia, especially in South Asia and more so in Sri Lanka. Um, and I feel it's part of my duty, really. So in this light, I try to spend my time also guest lecturing at the University of Visual Arts uh, and helping young students. I've uh, by default and almost uh, been forced, or I would say bullied into opening a school for, for young singers and young, young students who want to learn about the performing arts and how to learn to sing the proper way, because I was trained as a classical artist. And in addition to that, I, I started the Colombo Opera Festival last year for the first time in the country. Um, I founded an opera company, the Colombo Opera Company, um, with one other great patron of the arts, um, Mr. Mohanty Sanagam, who, you know, together has believed in my dreams really from the time I was a student and a teenager. And we've built something quite special and quite spectacular, I think. Um, the opera festival is hugely successful last year and we're carrying on with it this year as well. We've got you know, a plan of trying to bring an opera this time uh, to Colombo. At this point in time, what I want to make sure that I do is, <coughs> I'm also very passionate about making sure that women have a position in life, in society. Not only artists, but I think women in general, because in our countries and in our society, um, although we have a lot of you know, supportive people, there's also a traditional mindset um, and it's a very patriarchal society in many ways and so I, I feel that's also part of my mission that I must be one of those women who helps other women to not only come up the ladder but to find a different way and something that suits them.
I've been blessed and given with these wonderful people around and to keep living the dream. I think this is, uh, this is the way to go, to never stop dreaming, never stop believing. And my advice to anyone who wants to go an unconventional route would be just do it. Um, there's no other way. You have yourself, you can believe in yourself and know that if you want something badly enough, nothing and no one in the world can stop you and just do it. You can do it. I did it. So many have done it. And uh, you can continue to follow your dreams and live your dreams. And that's exactly what I'm going to do.